All right, welcome to another edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football Giants. Joining us is the executive director of the Senior Bowl, the one and only Jim Nagy, who has survived the 75th anniversary of the Senior Bowl. Congratulations, Jim. Hell of an event as always, my friend. Thanks, John. No, it's good having you down. Yeah, it was great being there. You guys obviously do do a really nice job. And different challenges this year, right? You had a bunch of guys that unfortunately got hurt over the course of the week. You had to have a defensive lineman switch teams basically on game day. What was it like handling uh, some of those challenges this year, which can obviously be be different depending on the year? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing was uh, having the 75th anniversary, uh, all those festivities going on during the week, you know, for a, for a six-person staff. That was a really heavy lift. So um, really proud of the staff, how they came together. We had 16 of our all-time greats down here. Uh, um, you know, obviously want to give them VIP first-class experience. So to, to be in the middle of our game week with 138 players and then bringing in these, these uh, Hall of Famers, yeah, it was, it was a lot. But it was great. I mean, the Friday night event, the Legends Gala we had was I – mean, there's been a lot of people associated with the Senior Bowl for decades down here, and they thought that was the best event we ever put on. So uh, Peter Schrager knocked it out of the park from the NFL Network, did a great job. So um, – but yeah, there, there's always challenges, man. There's always challenges every year. So it's, uh, you know, it's never smooth. We want it to look smooth from the outside, but, uh, but the, the staff did an unbelievable job and all the, all our volunteer committee just did a great job pulling together like we do every year and, and, uh, you know, have a great week. Yeah, it was definitely a mission accomplished. It, it all appeared smoothly. A nice Counting Crows concert, fighting through the rain a little bit on Saturday. Right. So, um, everything oh. was fantastic. You guys did a, did, did a heck of a job. Uh, as in terms of what happened on the field here, Jim, let's start with the quarterbacks because that's the first question I always get from people. And my answer is always, guys, I got to be honest, from my perspective watching, I don't try to take a ton out of the quarterbacks. They're throwing the receivers they're not familiar with. They're learning a new offense they're not familiar with. I'm sure the coaches who are in the meeting room with them get a lot out of it. You talk to them, you get a lot out of it. But I think judging how these guys are accurately throwing to receivers in offenses they're not familiar with, I think people can take a little bit too much out of that during the week. Yeah, I, I do think uh, there was a lot of completions, especially the first day. Like, usually the balls are hitting the ground a lot more than, than there were this year. And I thought all the guys got a little bit better yeah. every day. Um, you know, Bo Nix had a nice drive in the game. Spencer Rattler had a nice drive in the game. Um, yeah, so I thought those guys had a good week. And then just the feedback I'm getting from teams is, is they all did really well in the interviews, as you would expect from a group that has played so much football. I mean, Bo Nix is going to be – Wherever he goes next year, he's going to be on his seventh coordinator in seven years. <laughs> um, he's, you know, the all-time most experienced, most starts in college football history. Sam Hartman's played a ton of football. Spencer Rattler, I mean, Michael Penix, those guys have all played a ton of ball. So um, I know they did well in the meetings. and we, we had kind of the expanded breakout uh, meeting format this year with the quarterbacks where they got with, uh, you know, clusters of teams. I, I forget who the Giants were paired with in their cluster, but they got those guys for 40 minutes of peace. And then I was talking to uh, I was talking to Sam Hartman and Michael Pratt from Tulane before I left. And I said, how many of those 15-minute interviews did you get on the other days? And I said, they, they got all 32. So those guys are – those guys are leaving Mobile at 55 minutes with teams. Like, I just can compare it back when I was scouting – you'd be lucky to get a quarterback for five or 10 minutes down here. So like to go to a formal pro, you know, a formalized process, like we've, we've gone to way more beneficial for the players and way more beneficial for the teams. No, absolutely. And you guys do a great job with that. You mentioned getting exposure to these guys. The giants had a bunch of coaches down there. Shea Tierney <clears throat> being one of them. He was the OC for the team that had Bo Nixon and Michael Penix. Uh, your feedback from just, or just your experience watching Shea, work i've never seen him in a coordinator role he's a quarterback coach here i thought his energy was fantastic running around the field uh your feedback on him and of course you also had mike adams down there uh, as well the giants uh assistant special teams coach yeah we put those guys on different squads so they they would be exposed to the different players on a different team so you know shay was on the national and mike was on the american um i thought they did a great job i mean just overall with the coaches they you know they, they're very energetic um they see this as a real opportunity. They took it seriously. You know, they wanted to put points up. I mean, that was the thing, unfortunately, for the national team. There was a rash of injuries at, uh, at wide receiver. So we went into game day with three wideouts. And uh, Dylan Lauby, the running back from New Hampshire, was kind of the we, – we said we had three and a half wideouts because Lauby <laughs> could do some wide receiver stuff. So uh, 
but no, she, you know, they, they, they wanted to put up points. They saw that it was a show, you know, it was a showcase to uh, show what they can do, but they did a great job during the week. The energy level was great. They came together. Um, they gelled. There was a lot of cool relationships that are going to come out of that week. So um, all in all, it was, it was awesome. I really, I really do like this new coaching format that we went to last year, last year. Yeah, I think it works really well. It gives these guys a lot of exposure too, to, to you know, other coaches. You make connections, and one guy gets hired. Oh, I coach this guy at the Senior Bowl. Maybe I'll bring him in. I think it creates a lot of good connections. I'm with you. You mentioned the running backs, and you know, Dylan Lobb from New Hampshire, and I think kind of the group you had in, in Mobile. I've never seen more sub five ten running backs together in my life. I don't think, which is which is great, and I think it's kind of emblematic of this draft class, Jim. Right, where I'm not sure how many. You know, not that this player really exists anymore in the league, 20 carry a game type guys, but a lot of guys that can fill a role in a running back room and be a part-time player and do a really nice job at it. Yeah, I mean, I personally, I, I think that's the best body type for running back. You get like the five, nine and a half, 215, 220 pound guy. I mean, those guys are hard to bring down. And they, yeah. they, usually, they usually have really good contact balance because um, they're low to the ground and they're, they're hard to wrap up. So, um, yeah. You know, I, I think Marshawn Lloyd was probably the, you know, the top guy of that group. But, uh, you know, Dylan Albee had a, a, a really good week. You're seeing a lot of buzz about him. Um, just I'm cheating because I'm looking at the board right now. You know, Monty Bailey from TCU had a really good game. Did some really good things in the game. And the game is big for the running backs. You know, we don't – we don't we try not to tackle to the ground in practice. So, the game is big for, for linebackers, running backs. And Monty did some really good things. I thought Isaiah Davis – from South Dakota State, who's one of our bigger guys. He's right under six foot, 5'11", change, um, you know, 227 pounds, whatever he came in at. Um, he did some nice things in the game as well. Yeah, you know, mention the linebackers. I'll just jump there since you mentioned them, and I'm with you. I, I have trouble judging linebackers in practice reps. I just think it's hard. You're not hitting, you're not tackling. What linebackers jumped out for you from the game? Well, the biggest one in the game was probably Cedric Gray from North Carolina. Um, he showed up a bunch in coverage during the week, and he did yeah. the same thing. In the, he said did the same thing in the game. Got his hands on a few balls. Probably wishes he would have come down with a couple picks. But uh, man, he's he's what the league's looking for right now in a three down linebacker. They're just they're hard, hard to find guys that can play in space and cover. And uh, that's why I think Ced's going to be one of the top off the ball linebackers drafted this year because that's 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 his mold, man. That's what he does. So. Uh, you know, some other guys that stood out in the game. I thought that uh, J.D. Bertrand uh, from from Notre Dame had a good game. And I think uh, uh, Bookie Watson from Mississippi State was all, all over the place. You saw him playing downhill and, and uh, making plays at the line of scrimmage. So uh, those guys fared well. I thought they had a good day. You hear anything from from your scouting friends about Payne Wilson? Obviously, there's some medical stuff with him that will have to get cleared up. The teams will have to make their decisions on that. But I, I thought he did show up during practice over the course of the week. He did. He did. And his, his teammates voted him practice player of the week. You know, he could, he's going to run fast. We know that. Um, unfortunately he got, he got nicked on the last day of practice and, uh, you know, couldn't play in the game, but you know, and that, that kind of feeds into the narrative, unfortunately of, of, you know, him getting digged up, but, but a really good football player, really high character guy. We loved having him behind the scenes. He was great for our staff. Um, just great, great attitude all week. We, we voted on a, we had a we had a team member pass away this past year that has been connected to the, the senior bowl for about 20 years. Um, he lives up in, in Minnesota. He lived up in Minnesota and, uh, and he was just the best guy. We just all loved him. And, and so we named a, a good guy award after him. And, and Peyton Wilson got a lot of votes for that. He was he was a staff favorite down here. No, I'm sorry to hear about your guys lost condolences on that, Jim. Um, wide receivers want to hit a couple guys individual here. Malachi Corley. I know a big thing for him this week and i had a chance to talk to him on your media day and my gosh first of all you stand next to him he's literally built like saquon barkley the guy's a freaking tank he's massive <laughs> he's the tank yeah, yeah he, he's huge but he wanted to show these scouts that look i can run routes i can run the full route tree i just wasn't asked to do that in my role in college do you think he accomplished that this week in front of nfl scouts yeah, I got to dig into the tape a little more on that, John. But, uh, yeah, you're right. He's built like a tank. You know, the unfortunate thing was he, he didn't play in the game, and I really thought he, his skill set was was set up to do some really good things in the game because, you know, that's his deal, right? He's the run-after-catch guy in this yep. year's class. So, you know, one of the best ones. So, um, But he did show his strength. I did see that a couple times in practice, um, like at the top of routes and, and against press coverage. I mean, he's just a big, strong guy. And, and the route stuff did look the, – the route stuff – that's what he needed to prove, right? That he could, that he could, he, you break people off. 
And, uh, you know, when I was able to, I, I really gravitated more to the big guys during practice this year. Yeah. Um, but I, when I was down there for the one-on-one -on -one stuff, yeah, he was, he was separating. So that, that was good to see. Yeah, and the players voted him one of the wide receiver practice players of the week. So clearly they were impressed with what he did. And we will get to the yep. big guys in a second. Talk about breaking off routes. Two guys that had, well, I'll give you three, that had no problem doing that this week. Roman Wilson, Lad McConkey, and then Ricky Pearsall. Three guys that, boy, they once they got one-on-one -on -one at the top of their routes, there weren't many DBs that were sticking with them this week, huh? Yeah, no, I've seen Roman. I was popped into some some mock first round drafts after last week, which is cool to see. And we've had a day two grade on Roman since going back to the spring. He's he's been one of our staff favorites, so it's great to see Roman do well. Uh, you know, he started off the year so well for Michigan, and then they just kind of took the air out of the football in Ann Arbor <laughs> for the second half of the year. But uh, he made that one huge play against Alabama late in the game, which was an unbelievable uh, unbelievable play. But yeah, Ricky Ricky's a guy I felt like was really undervalued coming into the week. You know, I think I think a lot of teams had him in that fringe top 100 area. I think he solidified himself as a day two player. Uh, really tough, can get open, can play inside, outside. And then uh, who was the – oh, and Lad. Yeah, I mean, Lad was – I mean, even if you just scrolled through Twitter, Lad, Lad became kind of a Twitter sensation last week. Of, of, and I thought that's the kind of week he would have. He was our number two graded um, senior wideout in the summer behind Roma Duncey from Washington. So it did it wasn't a surprise to us. And I – there were some other guys. Like I thought Brendan Rice. He he had a he had a kind of a tough Wednesday, but his Tuesday and Thursday practices were were really good. I thought uh, Marcus Rosemey Jack Saint from Georgia was is kind of a sleeper from this class. I Which is Sean amazing. From How do you have a sleeper from Georgia? But I'm with I, you. I was really impressed with him at practice. I thought he did a nice job. He's Mr. Dependable, man. You throw it to him, he's going to catch it. Like he's going to play a long time in that league. He's one of the best blocking receivers in the in the draft. He's played a bunch of special teams. Um, yeah, man. He uh, And he caught the touchdown from Rattler in the first quarter of the game. So, uh, he, I told, he and I had that talk this week. I said, man, whatever, you're going to get somewhere, and some veteran quarterback is going to fall in love with you because every time every time he throws you the ball, you're going to catch it. I mean, he's got some of the best hands in the draft. So, um, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of those guys had a good week. And I thought Xavier Leggett the last two days, last day and a half um, before he got hurt, he had a really good Wednesday um, and then started off good Thursday. But uh, I thought he did some nice things too. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. Named a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by The Banker. As the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle, Citizens Made Ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Yeah, I, I have to go back and, and rewatch some of the practice stuff, too. Last receiver, Devontae Walker. Boy, he got open all over the field. I'm sure he's kicking himself for maybe not finishing some of those catches. And I hesitate yeah. to call some of them drops because a lot of them were, were tough catches. But, yeah. boy, if teams were worried about his ability, because he was more of a vertical threat in North Carolina, right? He was separating on all sorts of routes all throughout the week he was an impossible cover for defensive backs yeah and all you're seeing right now on social media is the stuff about the drops but yeah like you said i mean i think he's a three-level receiver he can get open um uh, he can get open anywhere and uh yeah he just didn't finish and that wasn't an issue on tape no so i don't think teams are going to have that big of an issue i think if anything you're just going to ask him kind of where his head was at because they did seem to snowball on him a little bit um, but I don't think it's a hands issue. I don't, I don't think Tez can't catch. And like you said, I mean, some of them were difficult catches, even a couple in the game. They took, they took a deep shot to him on a flea flicker to start the game. And, uh, it was there it would have been an unbelievable play had he made it, but, uh, it would have been, it would have helped him. But, uh, but some of them were really tough. Absolutely. All right. Before we get to the big guys, let's talk about the DB since they were covering those wide receivers. Uh, Quinion Mitchell, obviously he didn't finish the week, but my goodness, you know, Heading in, much like other people, he played so much off in, in, on his college tape. I wanted to see him play press. And, well, question answered. He was – that was one of the best cornerback performances I've seen in Mobile since I've started going to games over the last four or five years. Yeah, he was really good. Uh, the nice thing was we had, we had probably 10 to 12 guys that have been in mock first-round drafts, and I feel like all of them, you know, played up to what we thought they were going to be. So, um and he and Quinn Young being one of them, being a and again being a group of five guy, I think he felt like he needed to come here and answer some questions, uh, and he did. He had three really good days of practice, and uh, 
I think he really solidified himself. Maybe probably moved from a later first round pick to maybe somewhere in the middle of the first round. Maybe, you know, he and Terry and Arnold from Alabama, you know, fighting it out to be the the uh, first corner taken. So really cool to see him do that. You know, he's kind of a quieter guy. Um, was hard, you know, <laughs> kind of hard to break through and 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 talk to. But uh, <laughs> when we did once, once I did kind of finally break the ice with him, man, he, he's 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 really focused guy you know he's kind of the anti-db he uh there's not there's not a lot of flash to him he's kind of workmanlike in his approach like he was down here really at least for me he, he seemed like he had a business-like mindset on the week like he had he, you know he, he knew what he had to come down here to do he kind of was on a mission um so it was great to see him do a lot of good things in coverage got his hands on a lot of balls yeah and i loved his answer i when i talked to him he was one of the guys we had a one-on-one interview with on a previous episode of the giants huddle and you know jim i asked him frankly, why he stayed at Toledo. Because you know how it is now. You guys can't even find small school guys because they all transfer to big schools. It's impossible. But he's a guy that's stuck. And he's like, yeah, I felt loyalty to the people there and to the program. I think that's something that's going to really appeal to NFL scouts as well. Yeah, that's going to resonate with them for sure. I, I talked to his head coach, Jason Candle, about that. Um, you know, and they they did. He had, he had pl- trust me, he had plenty of suitors in the offseason oh, sure. to go elsewhere. And it is. It's crazy that now like group of five is small school for us. You know, like, I, I mean, it used to be, we used to, you know, we had one division two player in the game this year, but we were, we were averaging about 10 to 12 sub FBS players. And now this year, I think that number was like four or five, maybe. And uh, our small school guys are now, now the group of five, the Sun Belt and the Mac and those level players. So no, it was good. It was good. Q came down here and had a good week. Well, in a couple of years, the way these conferences are all joining together, anything that's not Big Ten or SEC will be considered a small school program with the way college football is going. They're crazy. All right, uh, two two slot corners, Andrew Phillips, Jarvis Brownlee. Uh, I thought they had had pretty nice weeks. And then a bigger corner, Kyrie Jackson, who is, you know, if you want a big cover three corner, you know, I think that's a guy you'll probably look at, right? Yeah, I think a lot. I think that corner group probably showed up better than any group on uh, on our roster, you know, especially in terms of like, where it was maybe perceived going into the week. I think Cam Hart's another big, big corner from Notre Dame who had a good week. Yep. I mean, you bring up Kyrie Jackson's name. There's people in Tuscaloosa, you know, this was his, this was his only year at Oregon. So he was a, he was a, you know, a four year guy at Alabama. There was people that thought he was the most talented guy in the DB room up there in Tuscaloosa. And that's, that's saying a lot. I mean, yeah. think of, I mean, yeah, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Terry on Arnold, um, so the guy, Elijah Jones from up your way at BC, he's another guy that was a late ad for us that, uh, I had multiple NFL guys hit me up on the field and they're like, really glad you brought the BC kid. Cause he's, cause he's shown up. So yeah. And then like another, another name you didn't mention, Shawweed Smith from uh, Washington state is another nickel player. I thought he and, and, and Jarvis Brownlee from Louisville showed up a bunch, but Shaw had those two picks in the game, which was cool to see. I thought he got in on the 83 yard re- interception return i thought they should have reviewed that we didn't have reviews in our game i thought it would have been cool to have an 83 yard pick six but uh <laughs> no i really like coming out of the coming out of the week i think there's a lot a lot more depth uh to the quarterback class than a lot of people maybe thought going into the week yeah and let, let, let's go safeties quick you know javon bullard i know he's listed as a safety but he's basically a slot corner as well what I was impressed by him, Jim, and I know, you know, there's no pads on during the week of practice. That's fine. His willingness to support in the run game, I thought was really good in some of those run game reps. He's only 5'11", 190 something, you know, but I, I think as NFL teams look for these slot guys that can do a little bit of everything, a la Brian Branch, guys like that. I think he's a guy that's really going to interest teams in terms of a pretty versatile guy that can play that slot spot. And so it's Tyke Smith from Georgia. I thought both Georgia guys yeah. had a really good week. You know, Bullard was uh... – Bullard was voted uh, safety of the week by his squad. And again, like you said, he can go back nickel and, and safety. And I think Tyke was, was mostly a nickel at Georgia. Um, he was player of the game for his squad and he played a lot of safety. And I think he helped himself a lot. He had three PBUs in the game playing, playing from depth. So uh, yeah, I thought both those guys had good weeks. Cam Kinchins from uh, Miami, one of the juniors showed up a bunch. Um, I thought Evan Williams, another guy that was kind of a late ad, a player from from uh, Oregon who who spent his first four years at Fresno. Evan had had a pick in the game, almost had two picks in the game, and did a bunch of good things during the week. So um, that group really got helped out by juniors. We had five junior safeties in the game, and and it, it certainly helped the overall depth and talent of that group. All right, let let's get to the big people here, Jim. You mentioned it. You could have a handful of first round picks just on the offensive line uh, by itself. So. 
your feedback on on what you saw from this group in the tackle class, uh, and and then we can hit on some of the guys individually as well. But w- what were some of the scouts in town of Al evaluators that you're friends with uh, were telling you about this offensive line group when they watched them down there? Yeah, I think there's going to be a run pretty early, John, on these on these often that this whole offensive line class, not just the tackles. It is a really good tackle group, but there's some some really good inside players too, like Jackson Powers Johnson. For the two days he was out there, was was lights out at center. Um, probably put himself in position to be the first center taken. And he came down here with a pre pre existing hamstring injury, and uh, and and hurt it even more. But the fact that he came down here and did it, like was already being mocked as a top fifty player, you know, in consideration to be the number one center taken, and he still came down here injured and played. And he says he's like Jim, I don't regret, I don't regret this at all. He's like I, I feel like I did what I needed to do. Um, had a really good couple of days. So yeah, he also that, did well a guard too. By the way, I think he showed teams yeah. he could be a guard. Yeah, he's a big dude, man. I've never I've never been up on him before. I, I I didn't see Oregon play live this year. So yeah, big guy. And then yeah, we can get into the tackle class. But I, I thought that they had an entire tackle class. Um, they all did good things. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you. Before we get to the tackles, Christian Haynes out of UConn. I gotta I gotta admit, I was not familiar with him before I showed up to the game. And boy, I thought a couple first day, maybe a couple spots where it was like, all right, I'm getting used to this now, getting used to some of these guys I'm going up against. I thought he was fantastic for most of the week. Yeah, I, he's got a cool body type. He's only like six, two and a half, but he's got really long arms, you know, so he's a good leverage player. Um, we, really, I, we really liked him in the spring when we watched him. He was one of the first guys I posted about in this year's draft class, right after last year's draft. Um, we started posting stuff on Haynes and he reminds me of a guy, Dylan Parham, who we had in the game um, from Memphis a couple of years ago, who starts for the Raiders. Um, was kind of, you know, was a third round pick. I think that's probably, I think Christian goes somewhere on day two. He was, again, the defensive line for his squad voted him, you know, one of the practice players of the week. So, yeah, I thought he, uh, he handled himself really well. And he got some, and he got some center reps, which we didn't see him do a lot at UConn. So, uh, yeah, had a really strong week. Yeah, and another guy that I thought got a lot of reps at different spots, which will help him, is Isaiah Adams out of Illinois, right? And he did that in college too. Not a lot of, not enough people, in my opinion, are talking about him coming out of that week. I thought he did a really nice job. He's a bigger guy. He showed power. He played tackle. He played guard. I think he even took a snap at center or two during practice. I thought he had himself a nice week too, to be honest with you. He had a great week, and we're, we're talking to NFL teams. I told Isaiah this. I said, I don't know what you're saying in these interviews, man, but you're you're killing it. I mean. <laughs> When, when I ask all these teams, like who, you know, which offensive linemen are, are uh, impressing you in the, in the interviews, Isaiah's name came up every single time. And he, he's another guy that was unbelievable for our staff, like great attitude, great energy, a guy you definitely want in your locker room. I think he's going to be a guard. You know, he played tackle really out of necessity this year for Illinois, like took one for the team. Knew he probably wouldn't, wasn't putting his best tape out there, but that's where Illinois needed him. So, again, that's another thing. Like, the NFL, the NFL teams understand that. And they're going to see that selflessness your senior year to, like, you know, he could have dug in and against Brett Bielema and said, you know, Brett, like, I came back for another year, you, you now you're playing me out of position, really. Um, so, no, that's going to help him. I, I'm with you. I, I think uh, good eyes, John, because I thought he had a really strong week. All right, offensive tackle here. Uh, let's go through some of these guys. Let's start with Tyler Guyton. Obviously, he showed the athleticism, strength. And it's funny, when I talked to him and I asked him this, he goes, I wanted to show a little bit of a nasty streak. But, you know, After every rep, there was a little bit of a shove, a little bit of a nudge. Yeah. And I think he kind of wanted to show that he had that mean streak to some of these evaluators. Yeah, because you, you get lost in the athlete. I mean, he's, a, he's an excellent athlete. I've, I'm on record saying it. I think he's the most talented tackle in the draft. Uh, I, there's he can do stuff athletically that nobody else can do he this guy glides when he's on the field and um so yeah i i could see that too there was a lot of extra stuff after after the whistle um well that's fine man i mean that's yeah that, that's if good that's what, if that's what they, it brings some energy to practice and if, if that's what these guys feel like they need to show down here if that's the feedback his agents are getting you know you don't want to be pigeonholed as just like a great athlete and a finesse level a finesse player so um, yeah, again, I think, I think guidance got a chance to go in the top 10. Jordan Morgan. Uh, I, when I talked to him, he was very clear to me that he's a tackle and not a guard. He did measure in just under 33 inch arms. Um, what are you hearing from evaluators? Do they see him as a tackle or a guard? And, and how do you think they're going to view him when we get the draft day? And, and, and how do you think his week was? Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't talked to too many guys about, about Jordan. I will, 
you know, once we, once I get a chance to get through this and it was just, it's so busy leading up to the game, no, of course, but like December and January is, are so busy for us. But, uh, but no, I think he can play both. I, I've said it before. The guy he reminds me of is Matthew Bergeron, who we had in the game last year from Syracuse, who went uh, early, early in the second round of the Falcons, like 36, maybe somewhere in there. Um, and I believe he started all 17 games as a rookie for the Atlanta Falcons. So, um, but he started at guard, you know, Jordan is a guy that it's kind of like when Joe Tooney was coming out of NC state, you know, Joe is a undersized guy, shorter arms, people picked him apart and now he's settled in at guard, but you know, he, he's played a lot of tackle. I think with Jordan, like that doesn't show up on tape. They, like there's not to me, I don't see a lack of length. I agree. Um, he's re he's really patient in his sets. And he does. So, he's so reactive that he stays in front of people. So you don't see like you don't see guys get on his edges and, and he doesn't look like a stubbier guy. So I don't know. I would I would certainly if I draft him, I'm drafting that guy to play tackle. And, you know, if it, I'm kind of one of those deals, like make him prove that he can't do it because out there at the college level, he makes it look easy out there on the left side. You mentioned upside at tackle. And I love watching Kingsley Suamatai over the course of the week, Jim. He measured in everything you want out of an offensive tackle. He can move. You see some of the hand placement, things like that, and need a little bit of work. But if he figures things out, he's going to be a really good starting guard in the NFL for a really long time. I loved what I saw out of him. Yeah, really talented guy. Best football is way ahead of him. Uh, you know, came out early as a junior. I think uh, even his representatives know that, you know, there's some rawness there to work through. But if you're a team that has a vision for him and is going to be patient with him and you feel like your offensive line coach is – you know, does a good job. I mean, shoot, two or three years from now, you could be hitting on a Pro Bowl level player. So, um, yeah, I thought Kingsley, I, I thought he got better every day, you know, watching the big guys. I think, I think he's a guy that steadily got better and I'll have to get back and watch the, uh, the game copy of the game. But, uh, but yeah, I thought he, I thought he consistently got better. And then finally, Patrick Paul, I think another guy that I kind of put in that category, right? Where you see the frame, you see the, I mean, the, the arm length is ridiculous. He's a big dude, a uh, soft-spoken guy when I talk to him, but, you know, has to put some things together, but he certainly has the body type and the athleticism that I think teams will be willing to take a shot on on day two. Maybe well, I, it, yeah, I, I mean, you know, the thing with the thing with Patrick, it's similar to like Guyton, um, He's so long, he's hard to get around. Now he's not quite the athlete that or bender that Guyton is, but I thought I thought Patrick showed some nastiness to him during the week as well. He did. Um, you know, and I think that was one of the knocks over the summer. I, I went into Houston in August and uh, spoke to him on the field, and there was a lot of scouts there that day. And uh, you know, he was just like, "Where can I get better?" And I said, "I mean." Based off what I saw and the feedback, you know, talking to other scouts, like, man, they just want to see you finish, you know, like you're, you're a big talented guy. Like sometimes it looks like it's too easy for you and you're on cruise control a little bit, but uh, yeah, he came down here with a really uh, like a, a, an increased sense of urgency, if you will. And uh, he makes it look easy in pass pro in a league that everyone wants to throw the ball around. Like that guy's not, he's not going to last very long because you, if you can find a guy that can dance out there at left tackle, I mean, those guys, those guys go, they go quick. So like you, like you, you just mentioned, could he be a day one guy? He could, man. It'll, you know, it depends on where this tackle run starts at. Yeah. You'll see it when you rewatch the practice statement, one of the one-on-ones, one of the defensive ends was getting a little physical with him and he ends up beating him on the rep and he kind of just stare, stares at him after the rep. And it's like, yeah, you see that. And you can see it that, that, <laughs> that he's trying to show that intimidation. I loved it because I'm with you. After I talked to him, I'm like, man, he almost seems too nice. Like, you know what I mean? You don't want your offensive line to be too nice. But then I saw that in practice, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, two guys that I thought really kept the energy up in practice, Jim, and I'm curious if you got any feedback on these guys, were the two LSU guys, Charles Turner and then Jordan Jefferson, his teammate. Jefferson in a play, I think he ripped off Christian Haynes' helmet on one of these reps. But there always seemed to be a lot of energy and a lot of trash talk from those guys, and they kind of kept, I think, the group energized as the, as the days went along. Yeah, Charles um... – Charles was locked in, man. I yeah. mean, he was, I mean, he, again, I think he's a guy because Charles is a really good athlete and he's a really good zone scheme fit. It's really good laterally. You know, the first tape we watched in here over the summer was Alabama from last year and gosh, he played his tail off. Um, but I think he's listened. He's heard the knocks that like, he's a little under bulk. He's, a, you know, strength deficient. I know LSU is trying to keep him to stay. So he could get, you know, thicker and stronger in the off season. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes we, when guys get pigeonholed as, you know, athletic zone type players, you know, they, they want to show a little bit and he, he was, he was, he was John pretty good. And I loved it. I didn't yeah. have any problem with it. And, uh, Jordan Jefferson, man, like there's certain guys every year that show up here better than I gave him credit for. They're just better players. That dude is strong as an ox. Um, he's got some knockback to him. He can play with really good pad level. He's hard to move all week. And, uh, yeah, you mentioned that one rep with Christian Haynes where he got kind of locked up with them and ripped his helmet off. But um, I thought he was like a, a backup level nose. Man, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised two or three years from now Jordan Jefferson starting a nose tackle for somebody. He is he is a big stout guy. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens, so go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? The huddle is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Yeah, absolutely, and he's very, very violent in a in, in a good way. All right, defensive line, let's hit some of these other guys. Two guys that were voted their practice players of the league, not surprising, watching practice all week, Braden Fisk and Michael Hall. And I'm going to put them in the same category, right? Because they're these undersized, super quick guys who get off the line quick and just get up field. And to your point earlier, it's a pass pro passing league. Now, if you have guys that can line up on third down to three technique and play like that, they're going to be valuable to teams. Yeah. Braden Fisk probably helped himself as much as anybody during the week. You know, I think going in, most teams probably were hoping they could get him early day three. And uh, I don't see him getting out of day two uh, out of the second round. Uh, I think he probably moved a couple rounds for people. He's super disruptive. Um, you know, really good initial quickness. He he creates for other people. He creates havoc. Um, and then he, and he can run and he plays his tail up like second play of the game. You see this guy flying out to the boundary and just blowing a run up. And I mean, he's when he accepted his invite, he called the office, which is cool. That doesn't happen very often. And uh, cause he didn't have my cell phone. So he called the office and we, we spoke a little bit. He wanted to thank me for the invite. And uh, I just said, man, I, I've never, I've, I didn't see those guys practice. I went over to Florida state and saw, I saw them play Vod tech, but I'm like, I haven't seen you practice, man. But if you practice the way you play with that energy, like you're going to make a lot of money down here. And uh, I said, we need tempo setters like that in practice. So come, come here and do a good job. And he did. He was almost unblockable all week. I mean, the guy was, the guy was awesome. And I just being down there, you know, in the, in the scrum with, with a bunch of the coaches, um, <laughs> He's a favorite. He's a favorite of the coaches that were down there on the field that day. And Michael Hall's a guy that, um, you know, a little inconsistent the last couple of years, a junior player that came out early from Ohio state, Ohio state opened up the Brinks truck for their junior class. I mean, they got everybody yeah, you back. Think? <laughs> it's unbelievable how huh, many, I mean, they got Travion Henderson to go back. So, um, well, Michael Hall is one of the only Buckeyes that, that came out and man, he did exactly what he needed to do. He's super athletic. You saw it on flashes and on tape. But he can bend, he can he can turn the corner on people. Uh, just a really twitched up three technique. Again, has a chance to be one of the better three techniques in the league if he can maintain that level. But uh, he did exact. He showed the teams exactly what he needed to show. Uh, legit, legit pass rush ability. Yeah, two other different types of defensive tackles, Jim. Tavondre Sweat, obviously a monster nose. And then the guy that I thought did well, and I don't think not enough people have talked about him. I'm sure if you've got any feedback on him is uh, McKinley Jackson out of Texas A&M. I thought he was a consistent pocket pusher, and he was able to move offensive linemen around. Yeah, no, I thought both those guys had a good week. Big uh, big T sweat. You know, I think a lot of people, I know that he, he thought that people would think he was going to tap out in the week, you know, and he played all the way through the game. So I think he proved a lot of people wrong right there. Uh, big, talented guy, had a really good year this year. A year ago, he was on the board, and we he didn't get an invite. He, we had him in like the fifth or sixth round, if I remember correctly. He fell kind of right below the cut line for us, and then comes back this year and wins a bunch of major awards. I don't know. I mean, he was I think he was Big Twelve Defensive Player of the Year. Um, but yeah, he's a massive dude. He's going to be the biggest guy in the draft, biggest and probably hardest hardest to move guy in the draft. So uh, Tavondre did a really nice job, man. I, I appreciated the energy he brought. He was another guy with Charles Turner, kind of kind of you know talking a little bit bit uh which i love to see i mean he's got he's got a little something to him and then like mckinley i thought mckinley was on the ground a little bit day one and slinging people around and uh 
I know the coaches weren't that happy. They don't like seeing players on the ground, but, but he did. He got better every day too. He is a big explosive guy. He you used to call him a pocket pusher. That's exactly what he is. I mean, he's, he's going to be able to play and give you something on third down because he's going to, he's going to be able to forklift dudes and, and walk them back to the quarterback. And he, he showed that here. So big explosive guy. I thought he had a good week. It looked like someone got Tavondre mad at the end of day one of practice. His first few reps, he kind of played, and you're like, okay, it's fine. And then it looked like something like turned the key on him because he started finishing some of these reps. And I don't know if a coach said something to him or whatever, but he, I thought he really picked it up as, as the week went along, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I need, you know, back to my time in New England, we used to always say there's certain guys that don't grow on trees. Tavondre Sweat doesn't yeah. grow on trees. Like if, <laughs> if you're going to want to be, there's a, there's a lot of teams that need that guy. You know, the last team I worked for was Seattle. I still watch a lot of see when I do watch NFL, I watch, you know, I watch a lot of Seahawks stuff, man. They could use that guy in the middle of that defense. I mean, he is, there's just, there's not many like him. So he's not going to, he's not going to last very long. I know that. No, I'm with you there. All right. Darius Robinson. I think he's right up there with, with Mitchell and powers Johnson as maybe the best player you guys had there all week. Yep. Where do you think he plays? Yeah, we just really, you know, and he won inside, won outside, won with power, technique, speed. He kind of won in a lot of different ways. What was your reaction to him, and, and where do you think he's going to fit best in an NFL defense? I mean, very similar to Vondre Sweat. He was another guy that was eligible for us last year, and we didn't invite, and uh, had him in like that fifth, fifth round area and made a massive jump this year. I mean, I, he asked me after the game back at the hotel if, if I thought he did enough to go in the first round, and – uh I said, Darius, let me get through the tape, man. But you certainly, you certainly create a lot of buzz down here. I mean, he, he was our overall practice player of the week. Um, we have the guys vote on each other for the regular practice players, but for the overall, um, I reach out to a front office person from every team. And uh, I think Darius Robinson was got a vote from all they, I haven't list their top three. You know, I think he was in the top three for all 32 teams. I mean, he wow. had a dominant week. He's, he's scheme versatile. It doesn't, you know, for a, for a guy like, again, just bringing up the Seahawks again or the Ravens, like these teams that like to throw a lot at you and do a lot of different things schematically, man, he's a cool chess piece because he's he's kind of played jumbo edge this year. He's played inside a bunch. I think he can play three, he can play five. Um, he can run well enough. You you can stand him up and play play on his feet. So he's just, a, he's long. He's probably the prettiest looking guy we had at the game this year. Um, sometimes those guys don't play the part. He's, he looks the part and plays the part. So, um, I'm just happy, happy for Darius because he, again, he, he didn't get an invite last year. He told me he took that to heart. Um, it was a goal of his coming into the year and for him to come down here and have the week he had, that was just really cool. All right. Edge guys real quick. Late to lot to, you know, Again, I think the same way when you watch him on tape, the athleticism doesn't blow you away, but he is such a technician on the edge. I thought he did a great job. Um, and then Chris Brazel, I thought was interesting. You know, I thought on tape, he showed a lot of speed rush and stuff. And I think, and he kind of said this to me when I interviewed him, he tried to go out of his way to show his power this week. A lot of his rush plan was, was bull rush and power instead of maybe using some of his athleticism to get around the edge. Your thoughts on those two guys. Yeah. I thought Leatu had a, had a really nice week. I'm with you. Like, I don't know if he's going to blow out the combine, but he's just a really accomplished rusher. He just, he's a, he, he, he rushes like a vet. I mean, he knows how to do it. And uh, you know, the thing they gave him a lot of, they gave him a lot of freedom at UCLA to kind of do what he wants to do. So I think, you know, teams just got to get locked into uh, you know, just him having, you know, playing off other people and things of that nature. But man, this guy, he's never out of a rush. You know, you love guys that can kind of stay in a rush once they get cut off and they, they got natural counter to him. And he, he has that, he showed that. I thought he had a really good week. I was, I was happy because he was a guy that's already being mocked in a bunch of top tens. So for him to come here yeah, and make that statement that like, yeah, you're talking about Dallas Turner and, and uh, Jared verse from Florida state, Dallas Turner from Alabama. He's like, you know what? I know those guys are good players, but I wanted to come here and make a statement that, that I'm the best. So I appreciated that. And I'm with you with Braswell. I think a lot of guys do that. I think, uh, you know, they come down here knowing that teams might question one part of their, their toolkit and they, they really want to, you know, show that. So I don't have any problem with it. I think it's a good plan. You know, if, if teams know you're athletic and they know you can win with speed, well, you're going up against a great tackle group, uh, a bunch of big, strong, long guys. Let's, let's see you get into them and see what you can do. So yeah, I thought, I thought Chris had a nice week as well. All right, last two here. 
Uh, Marshawn Nealon, I want to give him some love. I don't feel like a lot of people talked about him leaving the game. Western Michigan guy. I thought just – he's a guy that, that did jump out athletic to me, to me, Jim. And, you know, just the way he looks, the way he rushed off the edge, 34-inch arms, he checks all those boxes. And then I want to give some love to another player I don't think a lot of people talk about. That was Dwayne Carter out of Duke. I thought he had a really nice week at defensive tackle. He did, yeah. Marshawn's one of my favorite players in this draft. Um, I think he's going to go on day two. Um, there was a lot of teams when we did our calls in November when we were putting the roster together, already had him in the third round. Um, like you said, he's got like an 83-inch wingspan. He's got really heavy hands uh, so he can separate from blocks. He plays really hard. He can rush from multiple alignments. Um, I think you can kick him inside uh, on, on sub-downs, uh, so he'll give you versatility that way. And then, yeah, Dwayne's a guy that uh, I'm with you. I did another interview this morning, and someone brought him up on, on uh, ACC radio. They were asking about all the ACC guys, and I, th I thought Dwayne, watching the big guys, I thought he did a lot of good things. Um, he's, I think he's athletic enough to develop as a pass rusher. I don't know if you'll get that from him right away, but I think in two or three years you will. And then uh, he's, a, he's a really good leverage player. He's active, uh, plays really hard on first and second down. So, again, probably like a fringe top 100 guy that you're going to be able to get in the, the late third, early fourth. And a guy that's going to play a couple contracts for you. He's, like, he's the only three-time captain in the history of Duke. So, um, wow. and that's, that's a pretty high bar, man. If you're, if you're like the guy at Duke, um, it's a little different standard than, than a lot of schools. So high, high character guy. And, uh, those guys usually end up hitting their ceilings. And uh, I still think there's good football out there for Dwayne Carter. All right. Final question. Now that all is said and done, how big is it for your game that you now have access to these juniors moving forward? You could prepare for a little bit more, uh, how to go and how excited are you to have this be part of your game continuing into the future? Yeah, it's awesome, man. It's a game changer for us. So we were prepared. Um, the good thing was we had some conversations with the league office in August. So our guys were out watching. We built the board with juniors this year. There's always a couple guys that surprise you that come out. But I feel like for the most part, we were on the right guys. Um, yeah, and I think when, when, when next year's junior class sees how some of these guys help themselves down here, I think we're going to even have more of a buy-in. So, uh, yeah, the, the senior bulls, all, I mean, going back forever, has had great star power. Um, but now that you've got a junior class like the Michael Halls and the Jackson Powers Johnsons and some of these guys, Cam Kinchins, that came down and had great weeks, um, it's only going to help that. So we're excited about it. Obviously, the game and practice was a success, but I know you're trying to make the Senior Bowl a 365 operation here, Jim, 24-7. So tell the folks the other stuff you guys are doing, where they can follow you on social media, anything else they should know about the Senior Bowl as we head towards the draft. Yeah, we'll be doing. We'll be pushing a ton of content between now and the draft, John. Both on Senior Bowl Twitter and my my own personal Twitter. Um, that's what we've used for six years now to grow this thing, and uh, it's really helped. And then once we get through the draft, um, well, we are there. Our scouting assistants are already watching tape for next year. We're we're on to twenty twenty five. So uh, once the draft is over, we'll start posting all that stuff throughout the summer. We we do want to make it a year round thing. That was the goal with social media, John was like, we can't just pop up in like January and be like, Hey, look at us. You know, we're the senior bowl. Come look at us. Like we knew we had to live year round. Um, and that was the goal six years ago. And I feel like we've done a pretty good job at it. So, um, so yeah, if you're not following already giants fans, we'd love to uh, have you give us a follow. Yeah. And I think you've done a great job and have had a lot of success with that, Jim. Thank you so much for the hospitality. I think you guys put on a great event. It's just wonderful to go down there and get to know all these players, which I know you guys want to make it a showcase and you do uh, wonderful job. Thank you for your hospitality. And now enjoy some much deserved rest. my friend. <laughs> Thanks, John. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming down. Jim Nagy, director for the senior bowl on the John Siddle podcast. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time, everybody.